detectors. Uh, by now, black holes are pretty much accepted by astronomers as one of the many uh, inhabitants of the universe, but there was a time when uh, uh, this was not so. And uh, I will start from the very beginning. Actually, if I wanted to start from the very beginning, I should go back to a guy called Reverend Mitchell, who conceived of the idea of black holes in Newtonian gravity, but, you know, uh, you really want Einstein gravity to describe black holes for what they really are. And so we had to start with Einstein, who in November 1915, uh, after 10 years of struggling to put together um, Newtonian gravity with special relativity, came up with what we now call the uh, general theory of relativity. So he wrote down these very complicated field equations. He presented them to the Prussian Academy of Science in November 1915, and uh, he thought they would be very, very hard to find a solution to these, uh, these equations. What he didn't expect is that um, a German mathematician, Karl Schwarzschild, uh, would find a solution to the field equations under conditions of very high symmetry. So this German mathematician looked for solutions that do not depend on time and that are perfectly spherically symmetric. So, you know, it's a mathematical solution. It is what it is. He found it while he was fighting for the German army during World War I. And at the same time, he contracted a terrible disease. And in fact, he died on the front. Um, this solution was pretty much a mathematical curiosity at the very beginning. And Einstein himself did not believe that it described anything of physical reality for two reasons. One was a mathematical misunderstanding. There was an apparent singularity in uh, the equations that describe the solution. A singularity is a point where the solution goes to infinity. So at first sight, if you look at the solution, it looks like it's very badly behaved at some finite radius. And so people thought, yeah, you know, whatever, it's mathematics, it doesn't mean much. But then there was another solution, uh, another singularity inside and that, that's a different story that I will get back to a little bit later. Um, so, okay, there's some mathematical solution of the field equations, but no one really cares. Until 1930, where, uh, when uh, an Indian student, a very gifted Indian student by the name of Subramanian Chandrasekhar, wins a scholarship to go to Cambridge and uh, study astrophysics there. So at the time, you didn't have airplanes, so this guy gets on a boat and he travels for about a month to go from India to Cambridge, and on the boat he's, uh, he's doing math, he's doing what he, what he knows how to do, and he's tinkering with ideas coming from quantum mechanics that at the time was a brand new theory and special relativity, and uh, he understands that certain stars that are called white dwarfs uh, must collapse gravitationally uh, if they are more massive than a certain uh, uh, mass, which is 1.4 times the mass of the Sun, what we now call the Chandrasekhar mass. So he gets to Cambridge and uh, he talks to Sir Arthur Eddington, who at the time was the British uh, royal astronomer. So he was the world leading authority in astronomy. And Eddington in public ridicules his discovery and he calls it a stellar buffoonery. And, and Chandrasekhar who was a young kid at the time. He's completely shattered by uh, the, the reaction by Eddington. He decides to leave and he goes to the United States. He moves to Chicago, he becomes a professor in Chicago, he works for many, many years, makes a lot of discoveries, writes seven books, and in 1983 he gets a Nobel Prize for what we now understand was the discovery that these stars, when they are too massive, must collapse. Okay? Then, in 1939, something else happens. In 1939, of course, the, the Second World War begins, and at that time, there's another very brilliant physicist in the US who goes by the name of Robert Oppenheimer, and I'm pretty sure that several of you have heard that name before, who's working with a student, Snyder, on this idea of collapse. And basically, he understands in a paper that is now famous, but at the time went unnoticed, that stars can collapse and form what we now call black holes. But this idea goes dormant because, because of history. Oppenheimer basically has to stop working on fancy astrophysics, and he goes to Los Alamos, puts together a group of brilliant people, and builds the atomic bomb, right? Um, at the same time, there's another guy who's a main actor in this story, who's called John Wheeler. Uh, John Wheeler uh, went to uh, Denmark, where he studied with Niels Bohr. I was recently there visiting uh, the Niels Bohr Institute in 
Copenhagen, and uh, there's some nice pictures of John Wheeler. You see him here. He had a very special style when he lectured, and he used to draw a lot of diagrams on the board and then go through the diagrams one by one during his talks. He was a very fascinating uh, speaker. Um, Wheeler uh, was a nuclear physicist by training. So he studies with uh, Niels Bohr, and uh, then a tragedy happens. His brother dies in my native Italy uh, while fighting in World War II. And at that point, he decides that he really wants to get involved in the Manhattan projects. He joins Oppenheimer, uh, works on the atomic bomb. You know how that particular story ends. The war ends. In 1950, Wheeler decides to get together with uh, many brilliant students. One of them is this guy, Kip Thorne, who got the Nobel Prize just a couple of years ago. And he returns to the problem of gravitational collapse that Oppenheimer had attacked back in the 1930s. And uh, with this group of students, he understands gravitational collapse much better. And in 1973, he writes this book called Gravitation that is like a thousand pages thick, and I have two copies of the book in my office, and uh, that's how revered it is, and it's the Bible for everything gravitation. Um, okay. Then the 1960s. In the 1960s, there's a couple of crucial developments. One is that, once again, a mathematician springs to action. This guy is called Roy Kerr. And uh, I told you that the solution that Schwarzschild had found was very symmetric. It was perfectly spherical, and we know that stars rotate. So, you know, if a star collapses, it cannot form an object that is not rotating because of conservation of angular momentum. And this guy, Kerr, finds a solution that is what we call now a black hole, and it's rotating. So that's the mathematical progress. And by coincidence, in 1963, there is an astronomer at Caltech called Martin Schmidt, who discovers an object that is extremely bright, very far away, located at a redshift of 0 0.15, and changes. It changes very on a time scale that is very short. So he calls, the, he calls this object a quasar, a quasi-star. Uh, this object has to be very bright, very compact, and it outshines even the brightest galaxies. Now we understand that that object was the first supermassive black hole. So in the 60s and 70s, many other things uh, happen. One of them uh, is uh, developments that involve the space telescope that I will uh, tell you about in a minute. Uh, and Kip Thorne, Wheeler's student, uh, gets together with another bunch of very brilliant students, and they try to understand whether these black hole solutions are stable or not. They are still purely mathematical solutions, so people want to understand if they make sense at all, and they try to understand if they're stable, and they had to do a lot of math, and the math turns out right, and these objects are stable. Okay? All right. Not only they are stable, they are very fascinating. And they're very fascinating because um, two British mathematicians, one of them is Roger Penrose, and the other one is Stephen Hawking, they discover that the gravitational collapse that I spoke about before is a very generic feature. And whenever it happens within the theory of general relativity, it inev inevitably leads to the formation of singularities. Now, this is not the fake mathematical singularity that I was talking about before. It's a real singularity. So black holes are sort of like the time reversal of what happens in the birth of the universe. At the birth of the universe, there's a singularity, or, you know, a point at which we don't know what the laws of physics uh, look like, and everything expands out of the singularity. Gravitational collapse is basically the same film in reverse, all right? And so uh, Hawking, in particular, understands this fact, and he also understands something else, that if you try to combine quantum mechanics with black holes, then black holes are not quite as black as they are a picture to be because they can radiate. Now we call the Hawking radiation, we think that it holds clues to uh, the nature of quantum gravity that we don't understand yet. So, all in all, black holes are mathematical solutions of the Einstein equations. They do not involve matter. They're very pretty mathematical constructs that I can write down in two lines on a piece of paper. But they are extremely fascinating because as Chandra said, and Chandra is someone who has had a very active scientific life, 
In all of that scientific life, ex uh, life extending over 45 years, the most shattering experience for him had been the realization that an exact solution of Einstein's equations discovered by Roy Kerr provides the absolutely exact representation of untold numbers of massive black holes that populate the universe. This shattering before the beautiful, this incredible fact that a discovery motivated by a search after the beautiful in mathematics should find its exact replica in nature persuades me to say that beauty is that to which the human mind responds at its deepest and most profound. It's mind-boggling for someone like me who does physics for a living that you can write down simple equations and solve them and the universe works that way. You know, it's, it's really amazing. So what are, how, how do these black holes get there in the universe? Um, in several ways, we think, but the most, uh, the most likely way is through the collapse of stars. So what you have are stars. Uh, you guys probably come here often. You know how stars work. Stars work uh, through a balance of gravity and pressure forces. Gravity pulls stuff in. When stuff gets compressed, it becomes hot. It becomes hot. There are nuclear reactions. Those nuclear reactions burn, typically, two hydrogen atoms into helium and release some energy. And that energy generates pressure that pushes outwards. Okay? So you have nuclear reactions. You burn nuclear fuel. You push outwards. Gravity pushes inwards. And when stuff becomes more and more compact, there are other nuclear reactions that come into play. So you have hydrogen that bursts into helium, and then carbon, and then neon, oxygen, silica, and iron. And that's it. And that's it because iron, out of all uh, nuclear elements, is the one that has the lowest binding energy per nucleon, we say. So it's the most stable of all nuclear elements. You cannot make anything that is more stable than iron. Okay, uh, so when you run out of fuel, what happens? Gravity wins. And when gravity wins, all of this stuff collapses and the star dies. And it makes a big splash and it produces what we call a supernova. The first supernova was observed by Chinese astronomers back in 1054. And what they saw was they were looking at the sky. They were keeping very careful record of everything that they saw. And in their journals, they wrote down that a star suddenly appeared in the sky. It was there for about 23 days. And uh, then it disappeared. So they didn't know where it, went, where it went. And now we understand that this was a supernova. And what was left behind was what we now call a neutron star. What are all of these crazy things that I'm talking about? White dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes. I like zombie movies. And uh, I hope you like this movie too. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. This is The Night of the Living Dead. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, what, what these objects are, they're zombies. They are uh, stars who died and come back to life. Okay? How do they come back to life? There are several different ways that stars can come back to life. When a star is small, smaller than about three solar masses, take these numbers with a grain of salt because no one really knows, but let's say smaller than about three solar masses, then a star like our sun, um, after it burns its nuclear fuel, it expands, it becomes a red giant, then uh, it collapses eventually and it forms a white dwarf. If the mass of the star is higher, how much higher? Between about 3 and 10 solar masses. About, OK? Uh, then when the star collapses, it forms what we call a neutron star. But if the star is really, really massive, more than about 10 solar masses, then there is nothing to keep it from collapsing, and it produces a black hole. What keeps a white dwarf together is quantum mechanics. It's the uncertainty principle. It's actually the Pauli exclusion principle between electrons. So electrons don't want to be together and they push outward. What keeps a neutron star together is the same idea but for neutrons. And what keeps a black hole together is nothing. A black hole is just stuff that keeps collapsing. Okay? So if you imagine picturing gravity as the bending in the fabric of space-time, what you can imagine is that you have a large uh, sheet, and this sheet is only mildly bent by the sun. 
it's much more bent around a white dwarf and extremely bent around a black hole. And the way to understand the gravitational collapse that I was talking about before, a very useful analogy uh, comes from a book that Kip Thorne wrote, which is called Black Holes, Time Warps, uh, Black Holes and Time Warps, I think, uh, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. Uh, and and what, this is what he calls the parable of the ants. So imagine that you have a bunch of ants living on a membrane, like the one that I was talking about before. And one of these ants is a loner. She's an astronomer. She decides to stay at the side of the membrane because she doesn't like partying. But the other, the others, the other ants, they decide to congregate at the center and have some drinks. So they go to the center. And the membrane under the weight of the ants starts collapsing, okay? Now, these ants decide to communicate with the loner by sending little balls, okay? And they send little balls every one second, let's say. So they send a ball, and they send a ball, and they send a ball, but at the same time as they're sending balls, they keep falling because the membrane is collapsing down. And at some point, the speed at which the membrane is falling down is faster than the speed of the balls that they're throwing out. So in this analogy, the balls are light. And the, the fact that the, the ants are congregating at the center and collapsing is matter in a star that is collapsing to a black hole. And at some point, as you can imagine, there's a horizon. There's a point beyond which these balls will never get to the astronomer anymore. And he will think that these ants are frozen at that point. And in fact, initially, uh, people thought of black holes as frozen stars. That's what they were called in Russian books before uh, John Wheeler and the gang came over and started calling them black holes. So this is exactly what happens during gravitational collapse. From the point of view of the ants, nothing wrong happened. They just fell in and they got trapped. They'll die, but you know, whatever. That's life. So, uh, so you cannot see a black hole because by definition, not even light can get out. So how do we see black holes? The way we see black holes is through gas that is accreting onto the black hole. And that's because uh, physics tells us that neutron stars can never be more massive than about three solar masses. There's just no way that regular matter can keep them together if they are more massive than that. So you watch gas that is falling onto something that is very compact. And if it's very compact and it's more massive than three solar masses, then you can be pretty certain it's a black hole. This is the way the first black hole was observed in 1964 by this guy, Riccardo Giacconi, who comes like me from Italy and got the Nobel Prize, unlike me. And uh, he was here, and he, he played a major role in the development of, of the space telescope, as you all know. Um, and Giacconi went on, and he basically created a whole new way of looking at uh, uh, um, astronomical objects through X-rays. There's a second way that we can look at black holes, and I'll show you a neat movie here. This is not a black hole that is born from the collapse of stars. Uh, this is what the monster that lives at the center of our own Milky Way. It's called Sagittarius A star. And the way we see it is through the motion of S stars that are very close to that central object. This white dot is only there to guide the eye. It's not really there. And uh, you, what we observe over time, you can see the date of the observations over here, are perfect ellipses around something that we don't see. Now, from the shape of those ellipses, you can tell the mass of the big guy that they're orbiting around. And because these stars are so close, you can also tell that that object has to be very, very compact. So compact that the only reasonable explanation is that it's a black hole. And we can measure the mass of the black hole now very accurately, and it's 4 million solar masses. How they get there, we don't really know, and we want to find out, and I'll tell you some ideas that we have to find out. Now, uh, everything that we have seen in astronomy so far, we have seen it through electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are basically light of different frequencies, right? And uh, I find this image really fascinating. This is Andromeda, M31, uh, which is very, very close by, as far as uh, astronomical distances go. And you can see it in the visible. This is what 
you could see if you had a very powerful optical telescope. But you can also see that if you look at it in different wavebands, it looks very, very different. You're seeing very different physics and very different phenomena going on. For example, here, what you see are dust lanes. What you see up here is what the galaxy looks like in X-rays. And you can see that there's a lot going on at the center. And we now know that so much is going on at the center because there's a massive black hole there. But you also see a lot of stuff going on out here. And those are supernova explosions and stuff like that, very violent phenomena that you would never see in the optical. And what I find most fascinating is the radio observation. Can any of you tell me what those red dots are? You know? So those are quasars. Those are other black holes that are behind the galaxy, but they're so bright that they outshine the galaxy, like I told you before. So you see many, many black holes in the picture there. Huh? OK. Now, to explain a little more about uh, how black holes work, I have to introduce a little bit of general relativity. And I, will, I need to explain how general relativity is different from Newtonian gravity. Newtonian gravity is a perfectly good theory. I just spent about a month uh, over the street uh, there at, uh, at the physics department teaching only Newtonian gravity. It's uh, super beautiful and explains everything that you need to know about gravity in the solar system, except maybe one thing, but that's kind of minor. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, Newtonian gravity no works in the way that I bet most of you know. It tells you that two objects attract each other with a force loaded uh, is proportional to the masses of the two objects and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Now, that force law is very beautiful, pretty accurate, but it's wrong. And, and it's wrong because uh, it tells you that the interaction between two masses propagates at infinite speed. And because of special relativity, we know that nothing can propagate faster than the speed of light. So when Einstein discovered special relativity, he spent about 10 years thinking long and hard about how to fix Newtonian gravity so that it wouldn't clash with special relativity. And he came up with this crazy idea that gravity is not a force at all. So gravity is the natural state of motion of objects. The only reason I'm not falling through the floor is that the floor is pushing up on me. If there were no forces from the floor pushing up on me, I would be happily falling. And that's the natural state of all things. They just fall all the time. OK? So this is summarized by another famous phrase by John Wheeler, which says that space-time tells matter how to move, and mass tells space-time how to curve. How do we know that Einstein was right and Newton was wrong? The first time we found out was exactly 100 years ago. There was a very famous expedition led by Eddington, the same Eddington that I was talking about before, the royal astronomer, the one who ridiculed Chandrasekhar, who uh, knew that there would be a complete solar eclipse. And he knew where that solar eclipse would happen. So he set up an expedition. Uh, he himself went to a small island close to Africa, the island of Principe. And he sent other astronomers to Sobral in Brazil, in the Amazon region of Brazil. And they observed what happened during the solar eclipse. Why were they interested in this? Because one of the predictions of Einstein's relativity is that every mass must bend light. OK? So they knew that if they would look at the spot where the sun was, because the sun was there, and because it was dark, they could look at the positions, uh, the positions of the stars behind the sun and measure how deflected they were because they were behind the sun. And Newton predicts a certain deflection. Einstein predicts exactly twice as much. So they went and they looked at the position of all of these stars during the full eclipse. They had two different observations in two different places just to make sure that they got things right. And they found that Einstein was right and Newton was wrong. And then the next day, newspapers never trust the newspapers. They came out with things like light, solar skew in the heavens, man of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations, Einstein triumphs, stars not where they seem or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Now, um, we have seen that light bending in a much more spectacular way. 
and I'm sure all of you have seen this picture. This is the same light bending, but it's the much more extreme bending that happens around the black hole. Now, if I were living around the black hole, I could see the back of my head and discover a ball that became over time. Because light can form, the gravity around the black hole is so strong that gravity can go around in circles. And those circles are called light rings. And this is pretty much what you're seeing here. Okay, this is a light ring, it's beautiful. But it's still a, 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 an observation in the electromagnetic spectrum. What, what is, why am I here tonight? To tell you that there's a new way to look at black holes that is completely different and it's based on gravitational waves. What are these gravitational waves? Well, they are very different from electromagnetic waves to begin with. Everything that you look at in, in your daily life can be described by electromagnetic phenomena. And if you look at the typical wavelengths of those phenomena, you know, stuff that you see with your own eyes is in the optical. It's over here. It's a pretty limited band. Then you have the gammas, the x-rays, the ultraviolet, infrared, the radio down here, all of those beautiful images of Andromeda that I've shown you before. And that's one sense, right? One sense that we have to look at the universe. Gravitational waves are bending in space-time and they propagate at frequencies that are very different. In fact, if we had to understand them in terms of senses, they are, their frequencies are so low that they are more similar to sound waves. Sound waves are compression and rarefaction of air that we pick up with our ears, and they have frequencies that are very low compared to all of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, I'm not saying that gravitational waves are sound, but you can think of them as a completely different sense that you have to look at the universe that is more like hearing than it is like seeing, okay? And uh, what are they? So, gravitational waves, you can understand them pretty much as tidal gravity. Uh, so, you know, when uh, uh, the moon uh, goes around the Earth, it exerts tides, and those tides produce, uh, uh, you know, the effects that you see on oceans, for example. If you imagine that a gravitational wave goes through me in this direction, so you are sending a gravitational wave my way, what the gravitational wave does as it passes through me is it makes me thinner and taller and a little bit happier, and shorter and fatter, and a little bit sadder, and it does so every time it goes through, okay? So, by how much? Not very much happier, not very much sadder, because the typical displacement... So, if you imagine that you had a gravitational wave generator that you could put in this room, well, the best you can do to generate gravitational waves is, say, take one ton of stuff and make it spin as fast as you can. And if you look at the typical deformation that the gravitational wave would produce on me, it's one part in 10 to the 39. Okay, not very much happier. So there's no hope that we can generate gravitational waves on, on Earth and detect them. But if you start th talking about massive black holes in the universe moving at speeds close to the speed of light, you get a number that is still ridiculously small, it's about 10 to the minus 21. That's, that is still ridiculously small. So if I want to build a detector on Earth, I need to make it as big as I can, because I want to make it long, because that, that number is the delta L over L. It's the fractional displacement as the wave goes by. And even if I build a detector that is like one kilometer long, that fractional deviation is still going to be much smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So, about 20 years ago, when I started studying this stuff, the other physics students in my department were making fun of me. They are like, you understand how crazy all of this is? And they were right. Uh, so, it took about 20 years to actually get there. But eventually, we got there. And the way we got there is by building what is called a laser interferometer. And the idea here is that you basically have a long pipe where you make vacuum, you make the best vacuum you can make, then you shine a laser here. This, this laser is uh, split into two rays at something called a beam splitter. This is a semi-transparent mirror. So some of the laser goes up, some of the laser goes this way, and then you put two big mirrors at the end of each arm, and those mirrors reflect the light back. Now, if there is no gravitational wave passing by, uh, 
there's a photo detector here, and it sees that the light coming from the two arms interferes destructively, and so you see black. You don't see anything, okay? But if there is even a tiny displacement in each of those arms, then you don't see black anymore. And interferometry is a very, very precise way of detecting even the tiniest vibrations. This was Ray Weiss's idea and the one for which he got the Nobel Prize. Now, how big do you need to make those pipes? This big. So this thing is close to Mississippi, where I used to be. This is actually in Livingston, Louisiana. It's beautiful, except that there's a lot of crocodiles and alligators <laughs> over there. Uh, it's a nice place. I took pictures over there. Uh, and the, the bean splitter and the photodetector are housed in this white building over here. The light goes all the way down, almost, you see, almost all the way to the horizon. And you cannot fit this in a single picture. So, <laughs> you know, the other arm keeps going over there, somewhere over there. And uh, this is the one in Livingston, Louisiana. There's another one that they built in Hanford. Uh, and uh, in uh, what well, used to be a nuclear site. And then there's another one that they built in Italy. You can tell that the scenery is pretty different. It's close to where I was born. It's called Virgo. It was built. It's an Italian-French uh, collaboration with other contributions. So, okay, so what happened? These things turned on. Actually, the two LIGOs turned on. The Italians are slower. And uh, what happened is that in uh, uh, 2015, I started hearing rumors that something happened, okay? I'm not part of the LIGO collaboration, but I know many people. And, uh, and then uh, around February, I got uh, an email from one of the editors of Physical Review Letters, that is one of the main physics journals, telling me, uh, we got a paper that has a pretty big discovery. Would you like to write a popular article to explain what happens? Of course, I had heard something. And I didn't sleep for a few days until I actually got my hands on the paper. And then I wrote this thing here, and, uh, and, and this is what they saw. So what you see here is two black holes coming together. As they come together, they spiral faster and faster because they're producing gravitational waves. The signal is a maximum. And then these two black holes merge. They form a single black hole, and that black hole wants to become a simple rotating black hole of the kind that Kerr uh, wrote down in one line of math, and when it does so, it rings down. We call it ring down because it's, it's the same thing that happens when you hit a bell with a hammer. It, it wants to vibrate away all of the deformations, and it does it by producing a sound, and then it becomes the bell that it used to be before by ringing down. Okay? And here, I'm going to make you hear the sound that those two black holes made when they merged together. You're going to hear it twice. The first is the actual sound. If you take the gravitational waves and you sonorize them, that's what you would actually hear. And it sounds like a pop. It will sound, well, you'll hear it. And then they slightly change the frequency so that you hear the initial part of the signal a little better. So I'll play. So the thud that you hear, that's the, this ring down signal. And then they expanded the frequency band so that you can hear it better. You can hear what we call a chirp. It sounds like a whoosh more than a chirp. But it's pretty much the same way that birds make sound. It's a sound of increasing frequency and increasing amplitude. So it's the same kind of sound. It depends on the frequency at which you play, but it's, it's pretty much the same thing that birds do. Black holes sing, right? Okay, so this thing is published. Uh, they put in nominations for the Nobel Prize a little too late, so they don't get it the first year around, they get it the next year, uh, because this was such a big deal. And the people who got the Nobel Prize are Ray Weiss, who um, basically invented the idea behind the interferometers, Kip Thorne, that I nominated many, many times, and Barry Barish, who basically put together the collaboration and made it work as a, a particle physics experiment. A thousand people worked on this. So, what happened afterwards? What happened is that uh, besides those two detectors, notice that they turned on on September 12th, two days later, they detected something. 
So all of a sudden, we became just sensitive enough that we could see these things. And we knew at that point, we knew that we would see more. Okay? In fact, we have seen many more. The detectors were operational for a little while. You see from December until January. Then they turned on for an upgrade, and then they started taking data again. And uh, they saw a total of 10 binary black hole mergers and one neutron star merger, one merger of two neutron stars. And you can go now and look at these events as they are being observed day by day if you go to that website at the bottom, because it's open science now. Every time one of these things happens, an alert is sent out to astronomers who can go and look for electromagnetic radiation produced when these cataclysmic events happen. This is the catalog of the 10 events which are public and published. There's 10 black holes, and then there is one that is much longer. That's the merger of two neutron stars. Why was that so relevant? I will explain it in a minute. So, think again about the way that a gravitational wave works. It goes through me and it makes me a little taller and then a little fatter and a little taller and a little fatter. Now, I built a detector, which is two arms. So, if a gravitational wave comes in and it hits the detector face on from above or below, it's going to stretch and squeeze both of the arms, right? But if it comes from the side, it's going to stretch and squeeze only one of the arms. So, you would expect that these detectors are going to be a little more sensitive, see a little farther up or farther out in the universe if the waves come from above or below, and they're going to be less sensitive if the waves come from the side, right? So, this is pictured in, in this peanut here. This is the sensitivity of the detector to gravitational waves at different positions in the sky. It's more sensitive up and down, and less sensitive on the sides, okay? So, what this tells you is that a single gravitational wave detector is not very good at locating things in the sky. It's basically an omnidirectional detector. So, if I want to know where these waves are coming from, I need at least two detectors. Why? Because if I have two detectors, I can tell from the time that the waves arrive at one detector and the other that these waves travel at the speed of light. So, I construct two spheres that travel at the speed of light around those two detectors, and two spheres intersect in a circle. So, if I had two detectors, I can locate the source in the sky on a ring. Okay? It gets even better if I have three detectors, because if I have three detectors, now I can take the intersection of two rings, and I have two points in the sky. So, with two detectors, you locate the source on a ring by time of arrival. With three detectors, you can tell that it's either this point or the point opposite in the sky. Hmm? So, this is exactly what happened with the binary neutron star. They have three detectors, because the detection happened in August when the Italian detector finally woke up. So, the two LIGOs saw a signal. The Italian detector, unlucky that we are, didn't see anything. But it didn't see anything because the waves unfortunately for the Italians, were produced in the blind spot of the Italian detector. So, we knew, because it didn't see them, that it had to be in a certain location in the sky. And from that, we could locate the, the position within almost two points. They don't quite look like points, okay? There's experimental error. But then something miraculous happened, that at the same time, Fermi, an observatory to look for gamma ray bursts, observed the gamma ray burst just a little delayed from the gravitational wave signal. And by combining these two things, we could locate the source in the sky into a very tiny region. And at that point, the hunt was on. Every single astronomer on Earth, more than 3,000 astronomers, pointed everything they had at the spot in the sky. And so they started seeing fireworks. They saw optical, they saw everything. They saw everything, okay? That was amazing. It never happened again. We were super lucky. There's people who say that the L in LIGO stands for lucky, because the first binary black hole that we saw was super loud, and it happened two days after they turned it on. And the first binary neutron star, we located it in the sky super precisely. Now, we can use these observations to do cosmology. That's amazing. I don't have too much time to explain it. Maybe you heard in previous talks that there is a tension in cosmology now between measurements that are made with the microwave background radiation, 
cosmic microwave background, and measurements that are made locally by people like Adam Rees, who work here. They get different numbers for the expansion rate as measured by a quantity that is called the Hubble constant, okay? And gravitational waves are not quite precise enough to say who is right, because the measurement of the Hubble constant that they make has errors that are large enough that they're compatible with both measurements, but we hope that in the near future they will help us understand how the universe expands. What else happened? <laughs> These detectors went on again in April of 2019. I don't know why they chose April 1st. It's a very bad date. And after they turned on, they started recording events on a very regular basis. So regular that I, my slides are always outdated. So I don't know, if some of you came here early, I had 28 here. I had to write 31 because I, I gave a similar talk like last week for a high school in Italy and there were less. You know, they keep coming, they keep coming. It's super exciting. Every morning I have an app on my phone and I look at the app and it tells me there's a new event today. Great, it's a binary black hole, it's a binary neutron star, you know. So what are we doing now? We're building more detectors, because the more detectors we have, the better we can localize sources in the sky. So now we have two LIGOs, we have Virgo in Italy. This is a prototype that is not sensitive enough to see things. There's a new detector. The Japanese were super fast. They built a detector underground uh, in the Kamioka mine, and it's called Kagra. Uh, and uh, this, this is gonna start taking data before the end of O3, the third observational run. And the Indians are also rushing uh, to build their own detectors. They're going to get a LIGO shipped all the way from the U.S. and they have a site where they started making these giant vacuum holes. And uh, what's going to happen when LIGO India goes online is that we're going to have a network that is spread throughout the Earth. That's the way that they took that picture of the supermassive black hole, by having very many... Uh, observatories all around the Earth, and we're trying to do the same with gravitational wave detectors so we can locate the sources in the sky better and go after the electromagnetic counterparts. And like I said, you can go online. You see, I stopped, I took a screenshot of this website on uh, 1909-24, but now there are more. <coughs> they keep coming. There's more and more events. And you can go online and you can, you can see what's happening by yourselves. How much time do I have? I can, I can, oh, five, ten minutes, okay. I want to tell you something about what we understood from these first detections. First of all, we understood, we, we can now pin down more precisely how often these objects merge in the universe. We have a pretty good idea now of how often black holes merge. We have a not so good idea of how often neutron stars merge, but that's getting better. And at the end of O3, they're going to have a much better measurement of the rate. Um, at the end of the first two observing runs, we had not observed any neutron star black hole, so we could only place upper limits on how often they merge in the universe. But now the rumor is that they have seen some. And so by the end of O3, we will know more or less how often black holes merge with neutron stars in the universe. There is also some evidence that the rate at which things merge in the universe changes with the age of the universe. And that makes sense because these things are made out of stars. So more or less they should follow the star formation rate. The more stars you form, the more black holes you form. So we expect that the black hole merger rate should peak at some distance and then go down. Because when the universe was very old, we were not making stars, right? The other thing that we understood is that the masses of these guys that we are observing are very different from the masses we estimated before. If you remember, I told you that to estimate black hole masses, we looked at gas falling onto black holes, and from the orbit of the gas, we can tell how massive the black holes are. And those are the purple dots that you see here. Now, you can see that all of the black holes that LIGO saw seem to be more massive than